crisis, sites of crisis. That's their ra very raison d'etre. This is our raison d'etre. We, as humanists, maybe I'm projecting. We, as humanists, are embodiments of crisis. The material conditions of intellectual life, as those of any other form of human life, are of utmost importance. Consider this. More than a few decades ago, Marjorie Perloff in a very fine paper titled The Humanities in Crisis observed the economy that cannot accommodate, accommodate even the best of our humanities PhDs, this economy is a boom economy. Don't listen to this part. <laughs> Unemployment currently at a 40 year low of 4.2%. In such an economy, PhDs from Brown, Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, in the humanities are not getting jobs. That's a crisis. If you get to be a billionaire, you can ask philosophical questions and you can even audition for the role of philosopher king. Steve Jobs at all, Musk, on the way up to a livable wage, however, anybody desirous of a, of a training in STEM disciplines is likely to take a few courses in the humanities, less and less as it turns out, and they might find these courses to be surprisingly pleasant, especially from the grind of STEM disciplines, or at worst, they find them unwelcome distractions. Long ago, no. Uh, so I am acutely aware of how glib my thesis will sound in the ears of most of you, perhaps all of you. If I can wrest from this thesis substantive and methodological implications of no slight significance, this initial impression might be dispelled. If not, then I have wasted your time. So the stakes are very high. It's the last thing in the world I want to do is waste your time. <clears throat> so, I, um, I take my predicament then, and this sounds like, sounds like self-aggrandizing, but it, I don't think it is. I take my predicament to be precisely the larger one of the humanities themselves, because it's deeply rhetorical. I refuse to apologize for offering a no, take no prisoners defense of a wide array of humanistic studies, united by nothing more, perhaps, than a critical spirit of relentless and indeed ruthless criticism, ruthless criticism of everything existing. Those of you who know your marks have no doubt caught my allusion to one of his earliest writings. Those of you who do not, expect, and this is not to this audience, it's to an imaginary audience. Those of you who do not, especially conservatives, have no right teaching the humanities. To be innocent of Marx is to be humanistically illiterate. But then I would say the same about anyone innocent of the arguments put forth by David Hume, Adam Smith, Edmund Burke, Matthew Arnold, Isaiah Berlin, Michael Oakeshott, Roger Scruton, and a host of other conservative writers. Not necessarily these particular authors, but their positions and their arguments. So when my, especially my progressive and radical students come and are, create straw man of the conservative position, I send them to, to one or more of these people as I hope my conservative colleagues send uh, their students who could construct straw man of socialism to Marx himself. So let's tarry a moment or two with a text from which the expression ruthless criticism of everything existing was taken. It's a letter to Arnold Rugo. The young radical journalist, I'm gonna stop myself a number of times and, and this is performative. I mean, I, I think the humanities are uh, a series of self interruptions. A series of, there's a very fine book on interruptions. It's called the book of interruptions. Um, <laughs> co-edited by Adam Smith and Hillman. Uh, and I think self-interruption is really crucial. 
I think what therapy is, is about self-interruption. I think humanity is about self-interruption. I think friendship is about self-interruption. I think it's a neglected topic. But, but I can't go. So, so, so the young Marx, as a journalist, wrote about our civil war. Do you know that? And he published extensively about the US Civil War. And he did so in the New York Tribune. And you know who one of his most avid readers was? Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln found Marx's analyses as penetrating as anything on offer anywhere. Mm -hmm. He's on the other side of the pond reading in a, in, a, in a third or fourth language. And he's writing these extremely astute and deep cutting analyses of the war. There's actually a correspondence between Lincoln and Marx. We won't go into that. So back to Marx. To avoid having his readers miss his point, the young radical makes it explicit. I am speaking of a ruthless criticism of everything existing and ruthless in a twofold sense. The First, the criticism must not be afraid of its own conclusions. Second, it must not be afraid of the powers that be. So at the end of this article, Marx declares, the reform of consciousness consists only in enabling the world to clarify its consciousness, in waking it from its dream about itself, in explaining, I'm continuing the quote, in explaining to the world the meaning of its own actions. In the words of one of his, of Marx's almost exact contemporaries, Ralph Waldo Emerson, an essay entitled Experience, written the same year as this journalistic piece, 1844, it's written in the wake of Waldo's death, uh, five year old son of uh, Ralph Waldo. Emerson writes, same year as Marx wrote, if any of us knew what we were doing or where we were going, when we think best, we are deceived. We do not know today even whether we are busy or idle. The task of writers such as Marx and Emerson, Freud and Dewey, Virginia Woolf and Judith Butler, W.E.B. Du Bois and James Baldwin, Frederick Douglass and Angela Davis, Matthew Arnold and Isaiah Berlin is to provide resources for ordinary people in their everyday circumstances, which would enable such folks to obtain a more accurate, penetrating, nuanced and undistorted understanding of their doings and sayings and sufferings and desires. Lines from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure drive this, poem, home, this point home even more deeply. Proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence. Our alleged capacity to mirror the world without distortion our glassy essence might be very far from what we presume to be. One other footnote. I'm trying to construct a thick historical context in which I put a uh, lecture by James. And this is a footnote to one of uh, John Adams' earliest publications. I think it's his very, it's his second publication and it does not appear under his name. It appears uh, anonymously in the, in the Boston Gazette. He wrote a very astute piece on self-delusion. It ritually repays re reading and rereading and discussion. The young Adams is uncertain about his future. And for a man of his background at his time, that mostly, most immediately means uncertain about an occupation. He might even have been trying his hand at journalism in these juvenilia. But for our purpose, what is most important is that he discerns a link between political governance 
in the deeply rooted tendency toward self-deceit. There is, he writes, nothing in the science of human nature more curious, nothing that deserves a critical attention from every order of human beings so much as that principle which moral writers have called self-deceit. This spring is the spurious spring of self-love. Self-love in practice oftentimes translates itself into self-deceit. And Adams goes on to say, perhaps this, this perhaps self-delusion or self-deceit is the source of far the greatest and worst part of the vices and calamities among humankind. After Freud indeed, but even before him, this much is clear. Consciousness is not a given, it is a task. It is moreover, always to some extent incremental, no matter how many aha moments there are, it, it, it is incremental rather than purely episodic. It is a process in which there are distinct but not entirely separate stages of coming to consciousness. And that indeed is an open-ended process. The task of coming to consciousness by way of a critical engagement with our actual histories, plural, our actual histories in their irreducible heterogeneity, this task is one way of defining the task of humanities. Adventures of self-understanding to some extent inextricably entangled with misadventures of self-deception are at the heart of humanity. Think here of Sophocles, Aeschylus, Shakespeare, Jane Austen, Henry James, William James, Wolfe, Faulkner, Morrison, Octavia Butler, Judith Butler. Insofar as it is an achievement and not just a task, we rest self-consciousness, we rest self-understanding from illusory self-images. So, so the humanities are not simply in crisis, they are themselves the sites of crises, the very identification of which is both critical and controversial. This does not mean that the nature of a given crisis is in practice utterly undecidable. We do ourselves a grave disservice and we do our culture a bigger one when we reinforce the facile relativism of a consumerist culture. Who's to say? As though no one is in a position to say anything wiser than anyone else. The question is actually not who is to say, but rather how each one of us is to exercise our right to voice our position and more fundamentally, our responsibility to form that opinion in the first place. The attack on elitism is largely one mounted by one clique of elites against another. And this, this attack proves most effective when its advocates can wear the disguise of a populist. The opposition has divided and conquered us and we humanists have been to some extent unwittingly complicit in their endeavors to marginalize us. Yes, this is to some extent an instance of blaming the victim. Yes, the deck, the deck was stacked against us, but we could have been, and much more to the moment, we need to be smarter than we have been. To, pit the, to take it one example, to, to pit the traditionalist against the avant-garde and then to run the traditionalist out of town or worse has been for the most part to our detriment. Also to our seemingly irre irreversible marginalization. And I, I just throw, throw two, two examples of popular culture. The TV series in which Sandra O oh stars as the chair of an English department and the way in which all, all the professors are depicted 
uh, the extreme ageism of that. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, and also, I also think of, this is, this is gonna date me really well. Um, I also think of Flip Wilson. Where's Flip when we really need it? Uh, where's Father, Father Guido Sanducci when we really need it? But that's those are those are, those are by the way. But but Flip Wilson had this routine, which which was the Church of What's Happening Now, and it was a fabulous routine. Um, and sometimes I think the humanities is can get too close to the Church of What's Happening Now, chasing fashions. Uh, I think we're better than that. And uh, that's not who we are, but we lend ourselves to ridicules, uh, perhaps too easily. And I admit this is a caricature. So we can come together as traditionalists and avant-garde, uh, as, 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 as hip theorists and uh, really quite traditional historians, uh, and devote ourselves to, and this series is an exemplification of what I'm talking about. I just think they're, they're, the, 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 the people who are, do, who are doing the work down and dirty with the detail are really impressive. These, these talks have been wonderful. Uh, and I'm just stepping back from the practice and reflecting upon it. Um, so, so unexplored topoi, topics, the places that require us to examine, to interrogate. Topics is, of course, that branch of rhetoric devoted to invention, not least of all the invention of topics. Think, think about two, two exemplary figures here. Think about Michel Foucault and Judith Butler. What they in some, so, so she didn't quite invent it out of whole cloth. There was J.L. Austin, all kinds of people, but the, but the topic of performativity the very identification of that as a site of inquiry and interrogation, that, that itself was monumental. The site, the, 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 the invention, not the, the, the reinvention of the topic of power along the lines of a non-juridical model. That's, that's, that's one way of encapsulating Foucault's significance. It's the very, it's asking the, 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 the emperor's, uh, the child's question. You know, what about power? What about the body? Think about, you know, think about the topics that have emerged in the second half of the 20th century. They're, 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 they're blindingly obvious. Gender, sex, the philosophy has been oblivious to much of this. So have, so have other disciplines. So, 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 it, so topics. And, First and foremost, the identification of a topic, a site of interrogation. So, as much as anything else, we can trace our roots to rhetoric, both classical rhetoric and rena Renaissance renovations of the ancient traditions. But ironically, our failure has been primarily rhetorical. And on this occasion, I want to touch on ethos and pathos more than logos and only touch on, on those two. In the most important sense, as I understand it on this occasion, at least, ethos is the process of self-constitution, whereas pathos is the, the process of creating an audience. The cultural crises in which the humanities are entangled are, of course, manifestly political ones. Allow me accordingly to revisit what William James said in the opening decade of the previous century as a way of underscoring what the humanities might mean for a putatively democratic culture. He gives his talk at Vassar in 1907, late in the year, in November. And it's entitled, The Social Value of the College Bread. And there's some cringeworthy stuff here. <clears throat> James, imagining himself witty, says at a gathering of women that the value of going to college is acquiring the ability to know a good man when you encounter him. He is quick to add, this is neither a joke nor an abstraction. In contrast to technical training, a college education aims at giving, and here I quote, 
giving you the most liberal culture, the broader outlook, the historical perspective, the philosophic atmosphere, or something which phrases of set that sort try to express. James is, however, nothing less than prescient in this talk when he says, nothing future is quite secure. In particular, he notes, democracy as a whole may undergo self-poisoning. It was clear to James then, as it must be to anyone now, that democracy is on trial and no one knows how it will survive the ordeal. The case against democracy, as James summed it up, is in fact quite weighty. I'm gonna sum it up. I'm gonna sum up his summation. A qualification is ultimately needed, but let's just first hear his observations as originally conveyed. And here I quote, Fickleness and violence used to be, but are no longer the vices with the, which the pessimists charge to democracy. What its critics now affirm is that its preferences are inveter inveterately for the inferior. So it was in the beginning, these pessimists say, and so it will be forever. This is, as James sees it, the case against democracy. The qualification is, of course, fickleness and violence are once again to be added to the charges against a democratic ethos. In the name of freedom, the freedom of others are usurped. Witness the, uh, the trucks around the Beltway in Washington. What James adds to his brief is even more worth recalling today. Vulgarity, vulgarity enthroned and institutionalized, elbowing everything superior out of its way. And the picture papers of the European countries are already drawn Uncle Sam as a hog, a pig, rather than an eagle. Aristocratic privilege with all its inequities, and here I'm quoting, did at least preserve some taste for the higher human qualities and honor, and it also honored certain forms of refinement by their enduring traditions. In contrast, the democratic leveling drives an appreciation of such quality to vegetate in private corners. So sequestered a noble sensibility will have no general influence. You can just label it elitist and be done with it. Those who devote themselves to the cultivation of such a sensibility will be viewed as harmless eccentrics. It is rather ironic that James concludes his, his article in McClurk. So he gives it at Vassar and publishes it in a popular magazine. In, in the February of the next year. But he concludes his article, which is published in McClure's, by stressing how much the magazine, this the magazine in which he's putting forth his views, along with Collier's Weekly and its fashion, The World's Work, which is a, is a very business-friendly publication, how these constitute a popular university, rivaling the university. As such, they now assert that these magazines now assert, assert themselves as formidable competitors. If the professor, for all his misgivings about universities in general and about colleges in particular, nevertheless defends the, the essential function of indicating the endurable and the excellent as the tests of universities, he knows that emerging rival authorities are elbowing universities and colleges out in their endeavor to fulfill their function. Whatever powerful, however powerful these 10 cent magazines were in 1907 is nothing in comparison 
is what so social media is capable of producing today. To go back to James, the sifting of human creations, nothing less than this is what we ought, I would say, what we might mean by the humanities, the sifting of human creations. This includes the writings of such scientists as Darwin, Einstein, and Heisenberg as those as the writings of Dante, Chaucer, and Shakespeare. In sifting through these creations, we learn what types of activity have stood the test of time. We, to quote James, acquire the standards of the excellent and the endurable. Our critical sensibilities grow more acute and they grow less fanatical. At its best, such a course of critical engagement with the master strokes of human genius and human ingenuity allow us to sympathize with man's and men's and women's mistakes, even in their act of penetrating them. In a profound reflection on supposedly higher education, although he's really reflecting upon education more generally, in, in, in his reflections in 1936, Albert Einstein, it's the 300th anniversary of higher education of the founding of Harvard. Um, so in 1936, on the, on the 300th anniversary of higher education in the United States, um, Einstein notes near the end of his address that he has focused on the motives rather than the methods or the curriculum. He's very much concerned about what moves learners to learn. And he thinks that he was a terrible student. He was an absolutely terrible student. He did not get a fellowship because his mathematics professor wrote a letter in which he described Einstein as a lazy dog. That's not going to win you a fellowship. Um, and he, he, he discovered special relativ uh, relativity when he's working at a patent office. That was the best he could do. And he would finish his work and he'd work on his equations and, he's, and he won a Nobel Prize for physics while he was working uh, at a patent office. And the university system almost destroyed this person because it did not foster what he said is the most important thing, childlike wonder. Childlike wonder. So the motivation. Near the end, he, he, he does look at the, uh, the question of curriculum and he could be more, he could not be more explicit about what today occupies our attention, but what he hardly thought worth debating. And I quote, Einstein, I am not at all anxious to take sides in the struggle between on the one side, the follow followers of the philological historical tradition, and on the other, the champions of the natural sciences. Either one works equally well for education if taught in a critical experimental spirit. Now, I don't think you're gonna, that's gonna fly anywhere, but this is Einstein. <laughs> I, his words ought to give us pause. Right? His words ought to give us thoughts. So just, just, just take, take an example. What, 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 what might this look like? Uh, imagine a curriculum in which the lives and writings of such figures as Buddha, Confucius, Socrates, Sappho, Galileo, Spinoza, Burke, Arnold, Harriet Mill, John Stuart Mill, Darwin, Wolf, Marie Curie, Angela Davis, Constance Baker Mot Motley, of course, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, James, Dewey, Foucault. Imagine a, a curriculum in which there's a, these figures are encountered firsthand. This would be an instance of sifting through the master strokes of human ingenuity. It would also be an approach in which 
would also be an approach which promises to create an audience for students who are fed all too often, I, would, I think, strong. The vitality of, contemporary, of the contemporary humanities depends upon reclaiming the richness of our rhetorical tradition in practice. At the very least, it means a practical recovery of ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos, how to forge an audible, visible, effective persona in one's actual culture. Pathos, how to create an audience for what needs to be heard by people who, by people today, especially by those who have plugged their ears and blinded their eyes. Logos, how to use words and other symbols in such a way that they can accomplish the other two rhetorical tasks. Indeed, our disciplines are in crisis. This should be celebrated and exploited. They are critical in at least a handful of senses. This needs to be made manifest and indeed dramatic. We can make the case for their vitality only by dramatizing our own sensua in a sense precisely articulated by James Baldwin. And here I quote at some length, the word sensual is not intended to bring to mind quivering dusky maidens or black stars or any of that. I am, Baldwin continues, referring to something much simpler and much less fanciful. To be central in the sense I intended to be sensual is to respect and rejoice in the force of life, of life itself, including the intellectual. And to be present, to be present in all that one does, from the effort of loving to the breaking of bread. So I have no, um, I'm gonna skip a bit. Um, I have no doubt that we are doing just that, uh, that you are, you are teaching humanities in which uh, a dramatic sensuality is present in the way you read poetry or the way you reconstruct history or the way you do philosophy. I have no doubt that that's the case. But we do so largely in isolation from one another. We're not taking enough time to read one another's works. We're not taking enough time to talk about those works with one another. And we're certainly not taking, taking enough time. We're busy, busy, busy. Yes, yes, yes. But young scholars deserve our attention. They deserve our nurturance and our solicitude. We're doing so sequestered in a private sphere far removed, or we seem to think, far removed from the action. In truth, we are at the very center of the action. The intensity of our debates and indeed the depths of our confusion and ambivalence testify to this eloquently. The humanities will be continued, the, the humanities will continue to be taught. The most pressing question is not whether they will be taught, but these questions. In what conditions, in what context, in what form, to whose benefit, to whose profit, to what purposes? The drive towards self-understanding entwined with propensities to self-delusion is too powerful, too important, too dangerous, too exhilarating, too rewarding to discount or deny, certainly to repress. We know this. So too do most of our students, if only in a vague and incolate way. So do, so too do many folks such as Steve Jobs or Noah Harari. So in conclusion, a Socratic confession of ignorance, the courage to acknowledge that we do not adequately know the meaning of our own actions, our own utterances, our own desires, our own fears, our own ambivalences, a Socratic 
confession of ignorance is the beginning of this adventure. To use John Keats's phrase, negative capability. That is, having the capability of living in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, half knowledge, without any irritable reaching after fact or reason. Not, yes, we want to, we want to reach for facts, we want to reach for reasons, we want not to do so irritably and especially prematurely. This negative capability defines the enduring context for our defining pursuits. Coming to consciousness in a more accurate, penetrating, nuanced, and undistorted manner can be the reward of our persistence, courage, and ingenuity. Acclimating ourselves to an atmosphere of uncertainty, doubts, half, even less than half, simply partial knowledge is part of our value acclimating ourselves to such an atmosphere, and then making singular contributions to reflexive understanding. This is what the humanities are ideally suited to do. It's good work if you can get it. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you so much. Uh, so I guess the, the setup will be uh, questions, and if we have questions um, through Zoom, but when you have a question, um, if you could please come up and uh, share it into the microphone or the recording system. So um, we could start a, a queue or. Yes. Thank you, Vincent, for such an inspiring talk. I was struck by the anecdote about Einstein and his critique of universities as not fostering the childlike wonder. And I thought, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how we can do a better job of fostering that childlike wonder in a way of increasing appreciation for the human being. Thank you very much. Um, so there's a, there's a collection of essays by the British American philosopher he came here at the end of his life, and he, he did his most important philosophical work here, and that figure is Alfred North Whitehead. And the book to which uh, I'm about to allude is The Aims of Education, and he has, his, he has several wonderful essays, and, and, and he talks about the rhythm of education, and he distinguishes three principal phases. The first phase is romance. And the second phase is precision. And the third phase, he calls, I don't like the, the word, but he, I'll give you his, his generalization. It's really a dialectic, right? It's, it's, it's a synthesis of the, of the two. It's a, return, it's a return to the phase of romance by way of precision. So, so we began our courses in a disciplinary fashion at the level of precision. We, we begin with definitions. What we don't do is we don't sufficiently tarry with romance, the romance of learning, which is all what so so I think the questions that the ordinary person has, the connection between history, uh, the, the connection between uh, philosophy. Um, literature, the, the ways in which these, these questions, yes, they've taken a very technical, sophisticated form, abstract in some ways, theoretical in some ways, but they're actually rooted in human experience. And we have to reroute them. We have to replant them. And so I think the beginning of a course should begin with romance. What are the questions? In a sense, in the best sense of the word, naive questions. The learner can would bring to, if 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 if, if, if not sufficiently uh, sufficiently courageous and not 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 powered by anxiety of being a fool in the eyes of one's peers, uh, what questions would would I ask, would ask? So so I I I think I think we have to, I think 
we in the humanities have to be able to create sites wherein the transmission model is disruptive. It's not about coverage. It's not about the expanse of coverage. It's about the depth of understanding, including self-understanding, that are in, in the, the, the forms of self-understanding that are rooted in real life questions, right? And so, and so uh, uh, I try to show the continuity between uh, Socrates and Freud in our view and the kinds of confusions that Socrates is sorting out are not unlike the same kinds of confusions that Freud is trying to sort out, and that Lang and other folks are trying to sort out. So I, 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 think, I think it will, when I teach, when I used to teach, uh, teachers, uh, when I, graduate students, I, I, I try to suggest to them that the, the, the two most important instruments of a teacher are examples and questions. And, to, and, and, and I go in and I see them, they would outline they have these magnificent outlines with these beautiful definitions. And, 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 and there was no attention to why anybody would care about any of this. And it seems to me that uh, we have to tarry at the level of romance by taking the time to, to pose the questions of our discipline in an audibly human manner. Kathy de Cesare says, thank you for the engaging talk. Do you have any ideas on how to facilitate better collaboration among the humanities disciplines? Well, I think we have to take fuller, uh, uh, we have to take fuller advantage of the resources that are here. Um, and and, 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 and um, it's, it's really difficult um, because uh, the reward system is, is skewed in such a, fa such a fashion that I, I do not, I mean, Publish, publish. I think we as older faculty have a responsibility to seek out our younger colleagues, especially our untenured colleagues, and ask to read their stuff and try to give them really quite concrete, specific uh, encouragement and advice about how to get it published. So, so what were the most, I think most of us would say the, the, the most intellectually exciting time of our lives was graduate school. School. Reading the same books, we're talking, we're staying up all night, we're debating them. Um, why did we stop? Why is our professional academic life not so discontinuous with that the intellectual intensity of our graduate days? Yes, there are external pressures. I know that but we could be doing a lot better in terms of in, informal conversation groups, book groups. We, every department should have a book group, a book that we all, it, it, it transcends our specialty, what we ought to be reading. It transcends our discipline. And, and uh, it seems to me that uh, this, can, this can be folded into our individual research projects. It's not something on the side, it's actually quite central. We will do our individual, we will conduct our individual research project in a more enlightened, more fully contextualized way. Other questions in, in person or? Scott has a question. Thanks, this is for, for a great talk. Um, it's, it's not, it's, I don't know if it's a well formed question yet, but I, I'm fascinated by what you were, when you were discussing introduction. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on that point and the, the relation of, of the notion of interruption, a series of deviations or veerings away from um, as, as central to the, the humanistic enterprise. Right. So it's always important to, to, to uh, think figuratively, or better, to be more explicit and conscious of the, the ways and the depth to which we do think figuratively. So when we say, uh, for example, what are the ramifications of that? 
we should think of branchings. Remember, that's what the word means, right? So, 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 right? so, so, so branchings off, right? And, 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 and when we're writing a paper, we know what happens. We're writing two or three papers at the same time. And they're all, they're, they're, you know, they're all worthy of our attention, but we have to, we have to put some of them to bed for a while. We can't write, we cannot simultaneously. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna screw it up as a, a lead publishable article if we try to, if we try, and this, this is really true of dissertations, right? So, so how many dissertation defenses now faculty members have been in to say, this is really good, but you have, you're writing, you're trying to write three, this proposal is a proposal for three different dissertations and you have to make a choice, right? Time after, I mean, that, you know, we, we could just, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, so, so, so ramification, um, it seems, it, 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 it seems to me that, uh, we need to think about, we need to think figuratively about the way in which our research, our thinking, our teaching, our branchings. Um, uh, it's not a bad thing. Uh, I actually will play, um, Miles Davis in the, at the beginning of a class. And I'll, there's, there's a great, uh, CD with uh, Davis, with late Davis uh, in Hamburg, and he, he's with Kenny Garrett the Saxon, and they're having this fabulous musical conversation. And, you, and, and the relevance of that is that they're, they're stopping each other, there's, there's a, right? And, and, and each one of them, they're, they're stopping one another, and each one's stopping himself, and then they're branching off in new directions. So to, to see the way that, that works and to visualize it in different media, a musical one, a pictorial one. Uh, so um, I, I think that uh, there's always, not in any crude sense, there's always a degree of repression uh, because we're trying to realize appropriately an ideal of coherence, and we're pressing down, right? And there's this wonderful talk by Wolf entitled Craftsmanship, uh, in which she's talking about exerting control over words. And at the end, she gives up because the words want to have their say. It's as though they are, they have an energy and a tra trajectories of their own, right? And so, so the word, and, and, and writing is that part, we're being, we're, being, can, we're being continually interrupted. And by, by depths of understanding, and so, so can we be attentive to these interrupted forces and give them voice, if not in this essay, in some other essay? So, um, I don't know that, I, uh, but I, I do recommend this book on self-interruption. It's a fabulous book. Yeah, Science doesn't give answers. Right, 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 right. Science is no substitute for religion. And, and it seems to me that, well, the scientists are always changing their mind. No kidding, that's what scientists do. They follow the evidence where it leads. And, and, and if you want a definitive answer in the immediacy of the moment, you are, John Dewey will call it the quest for certainty, which has dominated Western consciousness. We want absolute certainty. And if we don't get absolute certainty, then nothing, everything is as good as that. So then, then, then we have skepticism. That's, get off of that. Get off, right? The skeptic is the, the, the person in quest of absolute certainty with a broken heart. Right? <laughs> betting, how about betting on certainty? How about good enough certainty? Right? So, so if, we have to acclimate our students to a world
world in which uncertainty is the atmosphere. And, 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 and if, we, if, we, if we use the human, if we, you know, if we use science or anything else as a ideology, political ideology, as a substitute for religion, that's worse than religion. Um, so, so yes, in type, we have to gradually, and we have to speak to their anxieties. Those are real, existential, cultural anxieties. And the damnedest thing is that the folks at the elite universities can afford to live in uncertainty in the way in which students at land grant universities cannot. And we have to change that. It's our mission, right? To wean them from the breast of certainty. I'm rich. Nothing here, no. Nothing here. Thank you.